Chapter 10 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Bering Gold. Chapter 10 Antichrist and Pope Joan. Part 1. From the earliest ages of the Church, the advent of the men of sin has been looked forward to with terror. And the passages of scripture relating to him have been studied with solemn awe, lest that day of wrath should come upon the church unawares. As events in the world's history took place, which seemed to be indications of the approach of Antichrist, a great horror fell upon men's minds, and their imaginations conjured up myths which flew from mouth to mouth, and which were implicitly believed. Before speaking of these strange tales which produced such an effect on the minds of men in the Middle Ages, it will be well briefly to examine the opinions of divines of the early ages on the passages of Scripture connected with the coming of the last great persecutor of the Church. Antichrist was believed by most ancient writers to be destined to arise out of the tribe of Den, a belief founded on the prediction of Jacob, then shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path. Confer Jeremiah 8.16 And on the exclamation of the dying patriarch, when looking on his son Dan, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord, as though the long-suffering of God had borne long with that tribe, but in vain, and it was to be extinguished without hope. This, indeed, is implied in the sealing of the servants of God in their foreheads, Revelation 7, when twelve thousand out of every tribe, except Dan, were seen by St. John to receive the seal of adoption, whilst of the tribe of Dan not one was sealed, as though it, to a man, had apostatized. Opinions as to the nature of Antichrist were divided. Some held that he was to be a devil in phantom body, and of this number was Hippolytus. Others, again, believed that he would be an incarnate demon, true man and true devil, in fearful and diabolical parody of the incarnation of our Lord. A third view was that he would be merely a desperately wicked man, acting upon diabolical inspirations, just as the saints act upon divine inspirations. St. John Damascene expressly asserts that he will not be an incarnate demon, but a devilish man, for he says, Not as Christ assumed humanity, so will the devil become human, but the man will receive all the inspiration of Satan, and will suffer the devil to take up his abode within him. In this manner, Antichrist could have many forerunners, and so St. Jerome and St. Augustine saw an Antichrist in Nero, not the Antichrist, but one of those of whom the Apostle speaks, even now are there many antichrists. Thus also every enemy of the faith, such as Diocletian, Julian, and Mohammed, has been regarded as a precursor of the arch persecutor who was expected to sum up in himself the cruelty of a Nero or Diocletian, the show of virtue of a Julian, and the spiritual pride of a Mohammed. From infancy the evil one is to take possession of antichrist, and to train him for his office, instilling into him cunning, cruelty, and pride. His doctrine will be not downright infidelity, but a show of godliness, whilst denying the power thereof, that is, the miraculous origin and divine authority of Christianity. He will sow doubts of our Lord's manifestation in the flesh. He will allow Christ to be an excellent man, capable of teaching the most exalted truths, and inculcating the purest morality, yet himself fallible and carried away by fanaticism. In the end, however, Antichrist will exalt himself to sit as God in the temple of God, and become the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. At the same time, there is to be an awful alliance struck between himself, the impersonification of the world power, and the church of God some high pontiff of which, or the episcopacy in general, will enter into league with the unbelieving state 
to oppress the very elect. It is a strange instance of religionary virulence which makes some detect the Pope of Rome in the man of sin, the harlot, the beast, and the priest going before it. The man of sin and the beast are unmistakably identical and refer to an anti-Christian world power, whilst the harlot and the priest are symbols of an apostasy in the church. There is nothing Roman in this, but something very much the opposite. How the abomination of desolation can be considered as set up in a church where every sanctuary is adorned with all that can draw the heart to the crucified, and raise the thoughts to the imposing ritual of heaven, is a puzzle to me. To the men initiated in the law that revelation is to be interpreted by contraries, it would seem more like the abomination of desolation in the holy place if he entered a Scotch Presbyterian or a Dutch Calvinist place of worship. Rome does not fight against the daily sacrifice and endeavor to abolish it. That has been rather the labor of so-called church reformers, who, with the suppression of the doctrine of Eucharistic sacrifice and sacramental adoration, have well nigh obliterated all notion of worship to be addressed to the God-man. Rome does not deny the power of the godliness of which she makes show, but insists on that power with no broken accents. It is rather in other communities where authority is flung aside and any man is permitted to believe or reject what he likes that we must look for the leaven of the anti-Christian spirit at work. It is evident that this spirit will infect the church, and especially those in place of authority therein, so that the elect will have to wrestle against both principalities and powers in the state, and also spiritual wickedness in the high places of the church. Perhaps it will be this feeling of antagonism between the inferior orders and the highest which will throw the bishops into the arms of the state, and establish that unholy alliance which will be cemented for the purpose of oppressing all who hold the truth in sincerity, who are definite in their dogmatic statements of Christ's having been manifested in the flesh, who labor to establish the daily sacrifice, and offer in every place the pure offering spoken of by Malachi. Perhaps it was in anticipation of this that ancient mystical interpreters explained the scene at the well in Midian as having reference to the last times. The church, like the daughters of Reuel, comes to the well of living waters to water her parched flock, whereupon the shepherds, her chief pastors, arise and strive with her. Fear not, O flock, fear not, O daughter, exclaims the commentator. Thy true Moses is seated on the well, and he will arise out of his resting place, and will with his own hand smite the shepherds and water the flock. Let the sheep be in barren and dry pastures, so long the shepherds strive not. Let the sheep pant and die, so long the shepherds show no signs of irritation. But let the church approach the limpid well of life, and at once her prelates will, in the latter days, combine to strive with her, and keep back the flock from the reviving streams. In the time of Antichrist, the church will be divided. One portion will hold to the world power. The other will seek out the old paths and cling to the only true guide. The high places will be filled with unbelievers in the Incarnation, and the church will be in a condition of the utmost spiritual degradation, but enjoying the highest state of patronage. The religion in favor will be one of morality, but not of dogma. And the man of sin will be able to promulgate his doctrine, according to St. Anselm, through his great eloquence and wisdom, his vast learning and mightiness in the holy scriptures, which will rest to the overthrowing of dogma. He will be liberal in bribes, for he will be of unbounded wealth, he will be capable of performing great signs and wonders, so as to deceive the very elect. And at the last, he will tear the moral veal from his countenance, and the monster of impiety and cruelty, he will inaugurate the awful persecution, which is to last for three years and a half, and to excel in horror all the persecutions that have gone before. 
In that terrible season of confusion, faith will be all but extinguished. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? asks our blessed Lord, as though expecting the answer, no. And then, says Marcantius, the vessel of the church will disappear in the foam of that boiling deep of infidelity, and be hidden in the blackness of that storm of destruction which sweeps over the earth. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. The sun of faith shall have gone out, the moon, the church, shall not give her light, being turned into blood through stress of persecution, and the stars, the great ecclesiastical dignitaries, shall fall into apostasy. But still the church will remain unwrecked, she will weather the storm, still will she come forth, beautiful as the moon, terrible as an army with banners, for after the lapse of those three and a half years, Christ will descend to avenge the blood of the saints, by destroying Antichrist and the world power. Such is a brief sketch of the scriptural doctrine of Antichrist, as held by the early and medieval church. Let us now see to what myths it gave rise among the vulgar and the imaginative. Rabenus Morris, in his work on the life of Antichrist, gives a full account of the miracles he will perform. He tells us the man-fiend will heal the sick, raise the dead, restore sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the dumb. He will raise storms and calm them, will remove mountains, make trees flourish or wither at a word. He will rebuild the temple at Jerusalem, and making the holy city the great capital of the world. Popular opinion added that his vast wealth will be obtained from hidden treasures, which are now being concealed by the demons for his use. Various possessed persons, when interrogated, announced that such was the case, and that the amount of buried gold was vast. In the year 1599, says Canon Moreau, a contemporary historian, a rumor circulated with prodigious rapidity through Europe that Antichrist had been born at Babylon, and that already the Jews of that part were hurrying to receive and recognize him as their Messiah. The news came from Italy and Germany, and extended to Spain, England, and other western kingdoms, troubling many people, even the most discreet. However, the learned gave it no credence, saying that the signs predicted in Scripture to precede that event were not yet accomplished, and, among other, that the Roman Empire was not yet abolished. Others said that, as for the science, the majority had already appeared to the best of their knowledge, and with regard to the rest, they might have taken place in distant regions without their having been made known to them, that the Roman Empire existed but in name, and that the interpretation of the passage on which its destruction was predicted might be incorrect, that for many centuries the most learned and pious had believed in the near approach of Antichrist, some believing that he had already come on account of the persecutions which had fallen on the Christians, others on account of fires or eclipses or earthquakes. Every one was in excitement. Some declared that the news must be correct, others believed nothing about it, and the agitation became so excessive that Henry the Fourth, who was then on the throne, was compelled by edict to forbid any mention of the subject. The report spoken of by Moreau gained additional confirmation from the announcement made by an exercised demoniac that in 1600 the men of sin had been born in the neighborhood of Paris of a Jewess named Blanchefleur who had conceived by Satan. The child had been baptized at the Sabbath of sorcerers, and the witch, under torture, acknowledged that she had rocked the infant Antichrist on her knees, and she averred that he had claws on his feet, wore no shoes, and spoke all languages. In 1623 appeared the following startling announcement, which obtained an immense circulation among the lower orders. We, brothers of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, in the Isle of Malta, have received letters from our spies, who are engaged in our service in the country of Babylon, now possessed by the Grand Turk. By the which letters we are advertised 
that on the 1st of May, in the year of our Lord, 1623, a child was born in the town of Burido, otherwise called Calca, near Babylon, of the which child the mother is a very aged woman, of race unknown, called Fort Judah. Of the father nothing is known. The child is dusky, has pleasant mouth and ears, teeth pointed like those of a cat, ears large, stature by no means exceeding that of other children. The said child, incontinent on his birth, walked and talked perfectly well. His speech is comprehended by every one, admonishing the people that he is the true Messiah and the Son of God, and that in him all must believe. Our spies also swear and protest that they have seen the sad child with their own eyes, and they add that, on the occasion of his nativity, there appeared marvelous signs in heaven, for at full noon the sun lost its brightness, and was for some time obscured. This is followed by a list of other signs appearing, the most remarkable being a swarm of flying serpents and a shower of precious stones. According to Sebastian Michaelis, in his history of the possessed of Flanders, on the authority of the exorcised demons, we learn that Antichrist is to be a son of Beelzebub, who will accompany his offspring under the form of a bird, with four feet and a bull's head, that he will torture Christians with the same tortures with which the lost souls are racked, that he will be able to fly, speak all languages, and will have any number of names. We find that Antichrist is known to the Muslims as well as to the Christians. Lane, in his edition of the Arabian Nights, gives some curious details on Moslem ideas regarding him. According to these, Antichrist will overrun the earth, mounted on an ass, and followed by 40,000 Jews. His empire will last 40 days, whereof the first day will be a year long, the duration of the second will be a month, that of the third a week the others being of their usual length. He will devastate the whole world, leaving Mecca and Medina alone in security, as these holy cities will be guarded by angelic legions. Christ at last will descend to earth, and in a great battle will destroy the man-devil. Several writers of different denominations, no less superstitious than the common people, connected the apparition of Antichrist with the fable of Pope Joan, which obtained such general credence at one time but which modern criticism has at length succeeded in excluding from history. Perhaps the earliest writer to mention Pope Joan is Marianus Scotus, who in his chronicle inserts the following passage. A.D. 854, Lotharii 14, Joanna, a woman, succeeded Leo and reigned two years, five months, and four days. Marianus Scotus died A.D. 1086. Sigbert de Glembourg, death, 5th October, 1112, inserts the same story in his valuable chronicle, copying from an interpolated passage in the work of Anastasius the Librarian. His words are, It is reported that this John was a female, and that she conceived by one of her servants. The Pope, becoming pregnant, gave birth to a child, wherefore some do not number her among the pontiffs. Hence the story spread among the medieval chroniclers, who were great plagiarists. Otto of Frisingen and Gottfried of Viterbo mention the Lady Pope in their histories, and Martin Polonus gives details as follows. After Leo IV, John Anglis, a native of Metz, reigned two years, five months, and four days, and the pontificate was vacant for a month. He died in Rome. He is related to have been a female, and when a girl, to have accompanied her sweetheart in male costume to Athens. There she advanced in various sciences, and none could be found to equal her. So, after having studied for three years in Rome, she had great masters for her pupils and hearers. And when there arose a high opinion in the city of her virtue and knowledge, she was unanimously elected Pope. But during her papacy she became in the family way by a familiar. Not knowing the time of birth, as she was on her way from St. Peter's to the Lateran, she had a painful delivery between the Colosseum and St. Clement's Church, in the street. Having died after, it is said that she was buried on the spot, and therefore the Lord Pope always turns aside from that way, and it is supposed by some out of detestation for what happened there. Nor on that account is she placed in the catalogue of the holy pontiffs, not only on account of her sex, 
but also because of the horribleness of the circumstance. Certainly, a story at all scandalous, crescit eundo. William Ockham alludes to the story, and John Huss, only too happy to believe it, provides the lady with a name, and asserts that she was baptized Agnes, or, as he will have it with a strong aspirate, Hagnes. Others, however, insist upon her name having been Gilberta, and some stout Germans, not relishing the notion of her being a daughter of fatherland, palm her off on England. As soon as we arrive at Reformation times, the German and French Protestants fasten on the story with the utmost avidity, and add sweet little touches of their own, and draw conclusions galling enough to the Roman sea, illustrating their accounts with wood engravings vigorous and graphic, but hardly decent. One of these represents the event in a peculiarly startling manner. The procession of bishops, with the host and tapers, is sweeping along, when suddenly the cross-bearer before the triple-crowned and vested pope starts aside to witness the unexpected arrival. This engraving, which it is quite impossible for me to reproduce, is in a curious little book entitled Puerperium Johannis Papai, 8, 1530. The following jingling record of the events is from the rhythmical Vitae Pontificum of Guglielmus Jacobus of Egmonden, a work never printed. This fragment is preserved in Wulfii Lectionum Memorabilium Centenarii, Sedecim. Prius quam reconditur Sergius vocatur ad sumam, qui dicitur Johannes, quic adatur Anglicus, mongutia iste procreatur, qui, ut dat sententia, foeminis aptatur sexu, quod sequentia monstrant breviatur haec vox, nam prolixius chronica procedunt. Ista de qua breuius dicta minus laidunt. Huic erat Amasius, ut scriptores credunt. Patria relinquitur moguntia, graecorum studiose petitur scola. Post doctorum, haec doctrix efficitur Romae legens, horum haec auditu fungitur loquens. Hinc prostrato sumo haec eligitur, sexu exaltato quandoque negligitur, fatur quod haec nato per servum configitur. Tempore gignendi, ad procesum ecus scanditur, vice flendi, papa cadit, panditur improbis ridendi, norma, puer nascitur, in vico clementis, colossoium jungitur. Corpus parentis, in eodem traditur sepultura igentis, Faturque scriptoribus, quod papa praefato, vico senioribus transiens amato, congruo ductoribus sequitur negato loco, quo ecclesia partu denigratur, quamvis interspacia pontificum ponatur propter sexum. End of chapter 10